Mind Your Farm Business on realagriculture.com is brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. Welcome to the Mind Your Farm Business podcast brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. I'm Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 Sirius XM. You can find more episodes of this podcast by going to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Today's topic on the Mind Your Farm Business podcast is the first of a two-parter looking at how different generations view farm management topics differently. Today, we'll focus on the topics of succession and finance. Even though we've come from the same genetics, different generations view these topics differently based on their own experiences. The more we understand how other generations view succession and finance, the better we'll be at accomplishing everyone's goals and desires, no matter the generation. Today's guest on the Mind Your Farm Business podcast is Justin Funk of AgriStudies, who has spent his entire career studying agricultural business issues. Let's get to our conversation. Justin, welcome to the Mind Your Farm Business podcast. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this topic because, you know, I think this is a, this topic of the multi-generational farm is something that most farms can actually relate to because it is very, very common. Um, give us an, an overview of, of some of the research that you've been doing on this topic and, and how far it dates back. Well, uh, first of all, uh, approximately 70 to 75 percent of farms in Canada right now are classified as multi-generational farms. So it represents a rather large segment and and a multi-gen farm we define it as being more than one generation farming on the same farm in the same enterprise at the same time. So that's not two enterprises sharing equipment or a farm that has already transitioned and is now just being managed by a single gen. This is where you've got two people uh, from the same family farming together. And uh, that in itself creates uh, a number of interesting scenarios and situations and, uh, and complexities. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research on this topic over the past few years, and a lot of it stems from the work that I've done in the industry classroom, where I work with uh, retailers, uh, people who work for seed companies or crop protection companies, equipment companies who are servicing a lot of these farms. And, you know, for for years leading up to the research, uh, I kept hearing anecdotally, well, uh, you know, I'm showing up on these farms that I have served for years and years and years, and now I'm finding that things are different. Um, there's another generation who's becoming more involved in the conversations or who is making the decision. And You know, that got me thinking the more I heard this, we need to maybe investigate this a bit further because any sort of research that is typically done is done with a single person on the farm. And that person is often the owner operator general manager. But on these multi generational farms, you've got this owner operator general manager, but you also have perhaps two or three other people who are involved in making decisions that are likely related to one another that we really don't know much about. So in 2016, uh, I partnered with my colleague at Purdue University, Dr. Scott Downey, and we launched the multi-generational farm study. And the whole idea here was to explore the dynamics that go on on the farm as they relate to these two generations who are farming together. And we did this by doing a quantitative component where we talked to about 400 farms uh, and some were older generation, some were younger generation farms. And then we did a qualitative component where we spoke to 50 farms and we made it a point to speak to both the older and the younger generation on the same farm, but in separate interviews to see how they viewed certain things like how they make decisions. What's the future of the farm going to look like? What are their personal goals? To see how much alignment there was with, with respect to farm management, decision making, uh, conflict, all of these sorts of things that go into managing a family farm operation. And and there are a lot, there's similarities how those people, you know, those different generations think. But there's also some differences, uh, of course, as you alluded to. And, and one of the processes where I think we really get to understand 
some of those differences potentially is in the succession planning process. Uh, t- tell us about how that process exposes uh, so how, how the different generations look at things uh, just a little bit differently. Well, first of all, um, it's important to understand where farms are in the succession planning process today. Uh, it's been an ongoing evolution, but there's quite a few farms that are currently going through succession, and there are some that are finished or consider themselves finished that process, which means they've successfully transitioned to the next gen, and then there's ones that are just getting started. And uh, one observation that we made was, first of all, the larger farms tend to be the ones that are right in the middle of it or have completed that process. It's the smaller or medium-sized farms that are just getting started or who in some cases haven't even had that conversation yet. And I think that there's something to that. Uh, I don't think that that's a coincidence. The other thing that we discovered, and this is a international study, so we did this in both Canada and the United States, Canadian farms, for whatever reason, seem to be further along in that process than farms south of the border. Now, that doesn't necessarily address your your question about some of the the differences that exist, but um, here's a few things that uh, we observe. One of the things is uh, what sort of factors are related to successful farm transition? So the very first thing that we look at there is everybody involved wants to make sure that there is financial security. Uh, I th- that's important for mom and dad. It's important for the son or daughter, uh, every, everybody involved. One of the things, though, that we noticed that was more of a concern to the older generation than the younger was making sure that the siblings who were going to be going through this process, those that were not going to be taking over management of the farm, were going to be treated fairly during that process. And that also in some cases represented a certain level of conflict uh, when it came to the how and the when and the why certain things were being done. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Whether you think about your own personal situation for a lot of the audience or you know, maybe it's uh, one of your farming peers that you're good friends with, we all know that that issue come, comes up a lot. It, it the, the impact can be mitigated, and there is, you know, when you say conflict, it doesn't mean explosion, um, but it, it definitely can be a, a point of friction. Well, it, it, and it can, and um, a, a lot of it stems from uh, communication, and that's another area that we observed that really stood out to us, that you know, one of the key factors associated with uh, successful farm transition or succession is making sure that there are proper lines of communication And one of the things that appeared to frustrate the younger generation was that uh, a lot of the planning uh, was not necessarily formalized. Uh, It's it's something that goes on inside mom and dad's head, but hasn't necessarily been articulated to the next generation. And so as a result, they don't don't necessarily know where they're going to come out in all of this or what is expected of them uh, throughout the process. And so, you know, any advice that I would give would be to make sure that, you know, those sorts of things are articulated early in the process because they could come back to uh, uh, bite you later because people's expectations are different than what actually is going to happen. Are are there additional obstacles that you found in your research associated with succession? Um, One of it is the timing of transition and succession. Uh, you know, I, I think you can relate to this, Sean, and, and I can too. I, I run a family business. Um, you know, the younger generation may feel they're ready to take things over, but mom and dad don't necessarily see it that way. And, and that is another potential area of conflict, um, especially if certain elements of decision making are uh, being withheld from that next generation. Even though they feel that it's something that they're interested in and something that they're ready for, mom and dad may not necessarily be ready to let go of control. And so that also is part of the communication process is making sure that expectations are set in terms of uh, how and when the transition is going to occur so people aren't just sitting on the sidelines waiting for their turn to bat. So Justin, that, that comment about, hey, I'm ready, 
You know, I think of if you were in an accounting firm or uh, a legal firm, th- there's a, somewhat of a process that is you know probably written down to actually become a partner and, you know, and, and have equity and you participate in the growth of that firm. On the farm, that's a much more unofficial sort of process that really can be determined sometimes by 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 how the the older generation how they see their future and because we we tie a lot of times operational decision making to equity and those are those are really two different things but it, it seems like in agriculture a lot of times we just sort of wrap them up into one sort of ball yeah well if a a key finding you know there's certain nuggets that come out of these pieces of research and something that honestly surprised me was the uh, percentage of farms that did not have a uh, official written plan. Uh, in fact, 43% of farms who were going through succession said they did not have a official written plan. And, and, w- and whether that speaks to the formality of it or not, I- I'm not sure. But the fact is, is that there are some that are uh, being a little bit more disciplined about this than others. And an interesting conclusion that came out of that is when you look at it based on size of farm, uh, it appears to be uh, a direct relationship between size of farm and written plan. Larger farms have a much more structured, formalized process, perhaps because they feel they have to, or perhaps they are being offered a lot of help from some of their uh, trusted advisors in this, you know, because there's mutual interest in in ensuring that smooth transition for some of these bigger farms. But uh, areas where uh, perhaps suppliers or consultants or advisors could really help us in some of these smaller farms who may not necessarily see the need for that plan uh, to be written and formalized to, to get them to have that conversation. No, I'm not sure if you have any research on this, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your commentary here. How, like, when I, when I think about how each generation views succession, th- there are some stereotypes, uh, and there is broad brush strokes here, but if we think about how traditionally each of those generations views succession, some of the issues that come up, are, are people's perceptions set in stone as they get older? So what, what I mean by that is, I, I'm the younger generation. I'm I'm keen. I'm eager. I want to you know I want equity in the farm. I want some operational decision making power. I'm aggressive and uh, and that's fine. And as I transition to be the older generation, when the shoe is on the other foot, do I do I do I have a better understanding of the succession process, or do I fall into the old traps that previous older generations have as well? Well, comparing this to the past may be unfair because I, I do think that the size and scope of operations, um, the uh, interest in the topic of succession planning uh, is a lot different than it was, let's say, when my dad was looking at perhaps taking over his family business years and years ago. We'll get back to the rest of the Mind Your Farm Business podcast, but first a word from our sponsor, RBC Royal Bank. This episode of Mind Your Farm Business Podcast is brought to you by RBC. For many, farming is a family affair, with each generation facing its own unique challenges. A solid succession plan goes beyond handing over day-to-day operations. Develop a plan that supports your farm's legacy and its future. Visit rbc.com slash succession and speak with an agriculture account manager near you. When I take a look, though, at things now, uh, for example, one of the questions that we ask each generation on the farm is, when do you expect to retire? Uh, the older generation said between 70 and 80 years old. Oh. And interestingly enough, the average age of that older generation today on these farms is 60 years old. That's that's the average age of the older generation on today's multi-gen farms. The younger generation, their average age is 33 years old, which, by the way, I think is interesting to look at. We, we, t- we use these terms older and younger, and I think we all have different perceptions of this. But when we look at older gen, we're not looking at a 80-year-old, we're looking at a 60-year-old. When we say younger gen, we're not looking at a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old, we're looking at a 33-year-old. And that adds context, I think, to the discussion. Well, you ask the younger generation, that 33-year-old, when do they want to retire? They're giving you a much younger 
age. They're saying it's between 60 and 65. And, and I, I can't go back in time and find this out necessarily, but I wonder if you would have asked older gen farm today, back then, when do you want to retire? Would they have said between 60 and 65? And as reality sets in and life gets in the way uh, and they get more experience, they adjust their expectations. I can also see that being a potential source of conflict. You know, and so mom and dad have invested a lot in the farm, put in a lot of equity. They have a certain perception of their work ethic that's gone into it. And younger generation is saying, yeah, you know, I don't want to work as hard as you do when I'm your age. You know, how, how does that conversation go down at the kitchen table? Oh, that's fascinating. I, those are really, really good questions. So we've, we've, we've talked about succession, but there's also transition and, and that's different. Um, talk about the, how it is different. Succession is more along the lines of the transfer of ownership. And so there's a, a major financial and equity component attached to that. Um, but often a precursor to that is transition of things like roles and responsibilities. So uh, as you become more involved in your family's operation, you might not necessarily be uh, given ownership or equity at the same rate you are responsibility. So one, th this was really intriguing for me because as I work with suppliers who are interacting with a lot of farms, you know, regardless of who owns the farm, you know, for them, a key person is who makes the decision for seed, crop protection, fertilizer, equipment, etc. So we wanted to be able to map out transition and see what it looked like. And there were some really cool things that came out of that, like what's the first product that is transitioned? You know, so the first product decision, can you guess what it is, Sean? What is the first product that the younger generation is typically given sole responsibility for on the farm? I think it has to do with spraying. Like a uh, selection of herbicides? That is one of them. Seed was oh, predominantly the very first decision um, that was given. And, you know, you take a look at that, whether it's seed or crop protection or fertilizer, you know, in this category of inputs, those, for all intents and purposes, are relatively low risk decisions. You know, there's a lot of good options out there and there's a support of retail partners that can help make decisions. So it's it's kind of a good one to ease that younger generation into before they're given more complex or uh, bigger stakes decisions like equipment, technology, financial services, marketing. All of these things tend to be later once that younger generation has earned more responsibility. And, and I say earn more responsibility. I think that's a fair comment because, you know, I, I, I take a look at my children. I've got a 16-year-old daughter. You know, I give her things in bits and pieces to see how she does with it. If she succeeds, she gets to do more. And uh, and I, I think any any parent-child relationship sort of operates that similar way, um, even if we're looking at managing a multi-million dollar farm operation. Uh, another thing that we learned with respect to that was how long a time is somebody given to uh, prove themselves in, in a certain area before they get something else. And it was on average about three to four years. Oh, So, you know, you look at that and you think, okay, it, it, this is not something that necessarily happens overnight unless it has to for some tragic reason, right? Um, so it becomes a bit more of a longer drawn out process than, um, than we might think. And again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, that can maybe represent a source of conflict because expectations don't necessarily match up with what happens. So, Justin, if I think about all of the different things to be transitioned in terms of uh, operational tasks and, you know, things to give responsibility to the younger generation for, uh, I, would, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the financial aspects or, you know, being face-to-face -face with a banker that would probably be one of the last things to transition from older generation to younger generation. Is, is that true? That is true. Um, and a lot of that is driven by the magnitude of the decision. Making financial decisions uh, is pretty, pretty important. Um, and it comes with experience. You know, and and I, I take a look, for example, like how do I make financial decisions today? A lot of those are things that I have learned or observed 
based on how my father made them, right? And so, you know, you become more familiar with these things. It takes some time to be at a position where, you you know, you can make good sound financial decisions. At least that's the, the theory behind it. Um, it's also relationship driven. And I think that's something else that needs to be considered. When we explored the differences in perception between different generations on the farm, when it came to financial service decisions, um, one of the things that really stood out to me was the younger generation kind of feels like in some cases they are being ignored by the financial services rep. Uh, you know, because mom and dad make a lot of these decisions, a lot of the attention is given to mom and dad. Uh, and the younger generation is kind of sitting there thinking, well, what about me? I mean, a lot of these decisions are affecting my future. You're not even involving me in this discussion one way or the other. And as a result, uh, <laughs> this has really caught me off guard. One of the more overwhelming comments that we heard was, uh, as soon as I'm given the responsibility to make financial decisions, uh, I am going to be looking at other financial institutions. Hmm. So you look at the consequences of some of these actions or inactions that are being uh, had on the farm. Um, you know, this relationship component one is important. You know, and and I think this is a lesson for other suppliers in the industry don't ignore this younger generation now even though they're not making a decision they're forming opinions they're forming perceptions and they're they're, they're getting ready for that day when they do have to make the decision and they're, they're going to be ma making that decision either based on what mom and dad did that they're happy with or they're going to look at it and say i want to do something different and i certainly wouldn't want to be on the outside looking in on that conversation now, I want you to take your researcher hat off for just a second. I want, to, I want you to put your pundit hat on. I want, I want your opinion based on some of this research that you've been doing. Let, let's stick with this financial aspect. So we've got, you know, whether it's the, the bank you deal with, the lender, or maybe it's the accountant. There's a lot of important financial discussions that happen. We, and we've been talking in terms of decision-making. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be giving the younger generation exposure to that process. And you, I, know, I know you love baseball, so let's use a sports analogy. Uh, uh, you just don't become a head baseball scout one day because you like baseball. You, you work your way through the scouting program, right? You may be a scouting assistant. Then you maybe get a bit of a territory. Then maybe you're, you're what they call a cross-checker, where you're evaluating the evaluations of some of the other scouts in a region. Then you work your way eventually at some point up to where you are the decision maker and you're the head scout. And you know, when it comes to the draft, you're the person that's really got the final call. In, in, in this context of agriculture, I think there's a lot of farms where... That we don't do the exposure part. We don't do that sort of like, okay, how did my mom and dad deal with this situation? We're, we're sort of, we keep them away from it because we just sort of deem like, you know, this, this is something, I, I think sometimes it falls into power, but w w people are kept out of it. And I think we would do ourselves a lot better in the financial management aspects of agriculture if we had much more of a sort of a, uh, some training wheels and, and some exposure put on as you work your way up uh, in terms of age and experience on the farm. What do you think about that? I, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, and whether it be financial services or making marketing decisions, that's another area where there's a big, uh, big gap, it seems. Marketing is one of those things where experience matters in making decisions. Uh, so just to be thrown into that without any experience, you could make some pretty costly mistakes. Um, so, it, it, but in response to that, uh, you know, I do think that to some degree, uh, farmers are recognizing that the younger generation needs more experience before they start taking on major decision-making roles. And one, well, there's two ways that we see that happening. One is there's, the younger generation today is significantly more educated than their parents were. Uh, about 58% of farms uh, say the younger generation has a university or college degree or diploma, which, which means they, they got off the farm, they took agriculture or business or whatever at school, they got experience uh, networking with other people. And all of this stuff, I think, enriches their 
their person so that when they come back to the farm, they can bring some of those experiences and knowledge back to the farm. Um, the second thing is uh, a lot of these younger generation farmers don't just come from school straight back to the farm. They work off the farm in egg retail or driving a truck or doing something different before they're invited back to the farm. Now, not in all cases, but in some. And again, that experience lends itself well. So I do think that farms are engaging in sort of developing the next generation uh, by encouraging that type of, uh, of experience. Go going to the money side of it, though, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to speak to this personally. Uh, I, I find it really important when I look at my kids to talk to them about money. Money is often a taboo subject, right? How much money do we make? How much money do we spend? How much does it cost to live? And I, I, my, my parents talk to me about money, and I think it serves me well. Uh, because I understood when I was now in a position to make and spend money of my own that that I understood the order of magnitude associated with certain things. You know, I, I think a lot of kids don't necessarily know how much it costs to buy a home these days or how much work goes into being able to afford a certain type of lifestyle. And a lot of that, I believe, is initiated early in somebody's life. So, I mean, really, when do you when do you start the process of transition and succession planning? Uh, you could argue that it's day one, right? It's yeah. it's when they're little kids. Uh, if that appears to be a goal that you have for your family and for the operation. On a future episode of the Mind Your Farm Business podcast, Justin, we are going to talk about all the pers difference in perspectives across a whole bunch of different topics between multiple generations. Really looking forward to that discussion. This has been great today to focus on succession, some of the finance area, and I look forward to the next time we chat. Thanks a lot, Sean. If you have multiple generations, you have the opportunity for conflict based on how we view succession and financial issues differently. Communication is key, but so is trying to understand and be empathetic to each other's perspectives. It's easy to just ignore the different expectations of multiple generations, but that is not good for your farm business, either in the long term or short term. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. If you have any feedback, comments, thoughts, questions, please email me at shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag Listener line at 855-776-6147. You can find more episodes of the Mind Your Farm Business podcast at mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Thanks to RBC Royal Bank, our sponsor. And until next time, keep on minding your farm business.